I, I'm going to sort of start with a sort of narrow, more technical exposition of what we're doing, leading then to where we're headed with it. So partly what we want to think about is, and partly on the theme of back to the big questions, uh, I go back to Robert Lucas's famous quote when Robert Lucas, who had been a U.S. macroeconomist for all of his career, started working on growth. He has a famous introduction in which he says, you know, once you start thinking about the questions of what exactly one might do to promote longer-term growth, it's hard to think about anything else, which has been sort of belied by the fact that the development community has been thinking about anything but uh, quite a bit, and kind of big picture questions have been uh, taken off the table by the sense that we don't have any rigorous methods for providing precise and exact answers to those. Um, that said, if you look at the processes of growth, uh, what you find is that the, the gains and potential losses from apparently quite discrete and identifiable shifts in growth dynamics have consequences that are just sort of enormous. So, you know, India in 1990-91 faced an incipient macroeconomic crisis, the exact kind of macroeconomic crisis with delayed devaluation, balance of payments, problems uh, that had exploded in Latin America in the 1980s into decade-long slumps. Uh, they responded to that crisis in a quite vigorous way in 1991 with an implement you know, what I would call paced orthodoxy, which is they more or less adopted orthodox economics, but sequenced it out over a long period, so it wasn't big shock, but it was pretty orthodox. And if you look at our, and I'll show you a bit what we mean by our sort of measures, the, they, that was followed by a growth acceleration in 1993. That growth acceleration added in net present value a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars in additional GDP over what would have happened had just business as usual prevailed. So now, growth then accelerated in 2002 for another growth acceleration with another NPV gain. So the total cumulative gain of the growth accelerations in India is on the order of three to three and a half trillion dollars. Um, on the other hand, you know, Brazil had a growth boom from 67 to 1980 in which growth was chugging along at 5% per capita. And I and a few others in the room will admit to being old enough to remember talk of the Brazilian miracle. Um, the Brazilian miracle came to a very sudden end in 1980. Uh, again, I'm old enough to remember that in the early 80s, we all anticipated that this was a temporary growth slowdown. Unfortunately, that growth slowdown lasted 22 years in which the growth, per capita growth in Brazil was exactly zero for 22 years. And if you, again, consider what was the cost of that growth slowdown in the sense of what GDP wasn't there that would have been there had Brazil had its predicted rate of growth, and I'll get to what I mean by predicted rate of growth, um, the, the net present value of the lost output from Brazil's slowdown is $61,000 per Brazilian. Now, even in this room, even in DC, that's a lot of money. Uh, uh, so what we want to think about is, so what I want to talk about three points today. First is what are the facts about the consequences of growth accelerations and decelerations? The second is kind of the implied rates of return to thinking about these things, just to get back to the big question. And then finally, just a very brief overview of our working hypotheses about what I call the guts of a gut, the, a grand unified theory that can help us explain growth dynamics that includes into our growth dynamics the political settlement work of the type Sam is talking about. So I'm going backwards often. OK, so now this paper that I'm presenting today is actually the result of sort of accumulation of work. Uh, a first paper that was produced together with Kunal and two other authors, one from India, one from Bangladesh, is um, First of all, we have a visual handbook. And in the visual handbook, we just present sort of the evolution of growth of every country in the world in a graphical way that's exactly comparable. So you can compare kind of the growth dynamics and trajectory of every country in the world in a set of eight comparable graphs across countries. Then the second paper 
and this is building towards a second paper, which is articulating our method for dating growth breaks, breaks which is I'll call biperone plus a filter, which I'll get to in a second. And then this paper, Trillions Gained and Lost, is an attempt to estimate the magnitude of each growth episode. So we're going to decompose each country's growth experience into a set of discrete episodes and then talk about how big each of those episodes was. And the reason we want to do this is we're kind of interested in how do you get into big green boxes and avoid big red boxes? Um, meaning how do you avoid growth slowdowns that cost you and, the, and your citizens like massive amounts of foregone income? And how do you get into positive self-reinforcing uh, growth so that you stay in high growth dynamics? So I'm just going to uh, sort of explicate the method using Brazil as an example. So the green line running through here is the time series of GDP per capita in Brazil. And what we do is we use Biperon, which is a statistical method for identifying the optimal growth breaks. That is, we just ask the data, given that time series, if you could break that time series into a set of discrete trends, where the trend changes, in what years would you put those breaks? Right? Where would you optimally locate breaks? And what the data say is I would have an acceleration in 1967 where growth got faster. I would have a deceleration in 1980 where growth got slower. And I would have a reacceleration in 2002 in which growth sped up. So these would be the three. Uh, so what Biperone produces is, is a series of candidate optimal breaks. And we run the whole method where each break has to be eight years apart. That is, a growth episode has to be at least of eight years. So we don't get into the business of identifying breaks that are tops and bottoms of business cycles. We smooth over business cycle frequency fluctuations um, to identify what we feel are plausibly discrete changes in the growth dynamics within a country. Then once we have identified the potential optimal breaks, we pass these through a filter uh, on the magnitude to determine which are actual breaks. And this is a kind of slightly esoteric discussion, but Biperone produces a statistical test of whether it's statistically significant break. That we don't use. We actually use a break of whether it's magnitude significant. And the basic rule is 2, 3, 1. The first break has to be larger than two percentage points. So the before after difference has to be two percentage points. If it's an acceleration that follows an acceleration, or a deceleration that follows a deceleration, the difference has to be one percentage point per annum. If it's a deceleration that follow, if it's an acceleration that follows a deceleration, it has to be more than three percentage points to qualify as a break. So, if you start to slow down, but slow from, if by Perone says in 1980 you slowed from three to two, we don't really include that as an actual break. So our actual dating is the statistically optimal candidates pass through a magnitude filter. And that gives us a decomposition of each country's overall growth into sets of discrete episodes of growth. Okay? Now, this has kind of been done several times in the literature in various ways. Um, now, what are, what are we trying to add? And what does this paper add? And then we'll get to why we're adding it. <clears throat> the difficulty is, is we want to know not just, we want to know OK, something happened in Brazil in 1980. How big was it? How important was it? Right? And the difficulty uh, is, is that you can think of the breaks in terms of their magnitude, right? but the actual depends on how long it lasts. So you could decelerate from 3 to 0, and that's a 3 percentage point deceleration, but that only lasts for 8 years and you pick back up. So the, the total loss isn't that big, even though the percentage change is huge. Whereas if you decelerate from 3 to 2, but that deceleration lasts 50 years, the total divergence of what the counterfactual GDP is huge. That's what we're trying to get at. It's how big was the kind of what happened subsequent to the break relative to what you would have expected. Okay? So that gets into the tricky part, which is what, what's our counterfactual? If we're saying something happened in Brazil in 1980 so that growth decelerated, and we want to say, how big is that deceleration? 
we kind of have to pay attention. We have to have some way of saying what would have been the trajectory of, of growth in Brazil in this period against which we judge what actually happened. Okay? So there are three ways of doing that. And we're not, I'm not going to. Uh, so one way of thinking of a counterfactual is let's just trend would have continued at its existing pace. So while this seems like a plausible counterfactual, turns out it's a really crappy counterfactual because the one fact we know about growth processes is that there's reg regression to mean. So if you're growing fast, your optimal prediction for the future is that you will grow slower than you're growing now. So the continuation of rapid growth is not a plausible counterfactual. Conversely, if you're decelerating now and have negative growth, regression to the mean suggests that the natural process, independent of any, definite, any changes in policy or anything else, will be to reaccelerate growth. Wow. OK. So basically, you can think of three degrees of regression to the mean in the counterfactual prediction. No change, but that's stupid because there is regression to mean. You could say the country would have just fully regressed to the mean and grown at the country average, but that's kind of too much regression to the mean. So what we do is for each country, for each episode, we run a regression of what we, we predict what growth would have been for that country based on its past growth. So for each of the 314 episodes, we run a regression of saying, what would have Brazil's growth from 80 to 2002 been by predicting, using data from all other countries from 67 to 80, what growth would have been from 80 to 2002. Okay? So I'm going to skip this. Um, so that, you, well, you either just understood that or you didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so but what that, what that gives us is the ability to calculate these boxes. What these boxes are is the simple product of the difference between the actual growth rate during the growth episode and the predicted growth rate during the growth episode times the duration of the growth episode, right? So it's what your GDP would have been had you had the counterfactual growth rate versus what your GDP was at the actual growth rate at the end of the episode, which depends on the duration. So basically what we've combined is the growth rate differential and the, and the duration of the episode into one single number. And so we can say for India, for instance, that this episode um, the actual growth was 4.3% per annum. The predicted growth was 2.2% per annum. So the growth differential of this episode was a two percentage points higher than the predicted, and it lasted nine years. And that produced a total gain um, of this episode of sort of 18% relative to the counterfactual. Everybody get that? Is this? OK, good. OK. So what that then gives us is a list of kind of what, what were really the big definitive growth episodes of all time, right? So basically, this is the years of the identified episode of the various countries. This is the gain. UCP stands for unconditional prediction, which is our prediction regression. And this is the gain relative to the un uh, unconditional prediction. So we basically have 30 episodes in which relative to what you would have expected, there was a 50 percentage point higher GDP from the episode. So that how we define big is 50%, which means 50% is a lot. I mean, if your income went up 50%, you'd be pretty happy, right? Um, and so what we identify <laughs> through this method are countries that not just had growth accelerations, but by and large had growth accelerations that persisted for a long time. So kind of to be a big growth positive episode, you both have to accelerate it and duration. So Egypt had a long duration episode from 76 to 92. Indonesia had a long duration episode from 67 to 96. Um, China had, as we all know, a long duration, had back to back um, acceleration 77 to 91, followed by another acceleration from 91 to 2010. And we identify sort of all of the big growth accelerations. Um, then we also, can, we also identify the big sort of collapses. Um, and by the way, 
once we have the sort of magnitude of the episode, we, we also have the magnitude of the episode year by year, right? Because each year there's the difference from the counterfactual. If you add them up, you can get the NPV, right? And so the growth acceleration that started in 1991 in China has produced a, a net present value gain in GDP of $11 trillion. So there's $11 trillion more. Okay, so Mike is telling me to quit. So conversely, we also identify the large collapses, right? And so I'm just going to make two quick points in spite of Michael telling me to collapse, uh, to quit. So the first point is <clears throat> if you calculate the cost of all economists ever, um, and so I calculated uh, uh, <laughs> the total cost uh, in net present value terms of all economics dating back to 1776. So if you accumulate <laughs> an over-optimist, I mean, uh, overestimation, if we assume that the expense of all economists in the world had remained constant back to 1776, and we added it up, like what has it cost us in 1977 to have had economics, it adds up to $200 billion. Right? Okay. $200 billion is what all of economics has cost us since Adam Smith, right? And then we say, well, if that even changed by, you know, was it worth it to spend all that money on economics, right? Well, if that changed even by 10 percentage points, the likelihood that China would embark on the growth accelerations that we had, the just 10% of the value of China's gains from growth acceleration is $1.4 trillion. So if all of economics ever done just had a 10 percentage point increase in the likelihood China would move towards market-oriented growth, it pays for itself seven times over. Not that it caused it, not that it determined it, but just that it mildly nudged it in that direction, right? Even just 10 percent of India's gains from the growth accelerations makes all of economics since Adam Smith pay for itself. Um, now, the, the other obvious, well, I'm not going to get there. Okay. Okay. So where does this come back to, though? Um, what this comes back to is all of this is setting up the question that we want to answer. What is it that creates growth processes that produce long episodes of sustained growth? And what is it about the politics of growth that causes growth to stop in sudden and disastrous collapses? both of which we observe in the data. And our working hypothesis really centers, as Sam pointed out, around political settlements and state business relationships, in which we believe that sustained growth requires structural transformation in the Hausman sense, which we can get to, and a dynamic of better and better institutions. But that dynamic of better institutions has to be compatible with the underlying politics of accumulation of the growth process. And that starts from developing countries live in a deals world, not in a rules world. That is, if we think of in Sam's figure of these number six people that are in high impersonalized rule of law, we're not in there. We're in those four other boxes of, com of competitive clientelism. And in a deals world, um, we can have different kinds of things. We can have essentially deals are firm specific uh, relationships between the state. And actually, closed order deals can provide for rapid growth. A closed order deal means you make a deal, the deal stays done. The deal may not be open, it may not be rule of law based, may be based on corruption. But if the deal stays done when you make a deal, you can actually sustain really rapid economic growth in a super, in a, in a deals, in, I mean, in a, in a uh, I was going to use the word, uh, uh, what am I searching for? In a super ugly <laughs> political and environment, you can still sustain really long episodes of growth if it's a stable deals environment. But the problem is, is these closed order deals environment tend to also lead to spectacular collapses when they finish. Because the underlying politics of them often leads to a political feedback loops that causes punctuated collapses into disordered deals, which then shock ca can cause 
equal magnitude retrogression. So the key question is, what are the mechanisms whereby closed order deals can produce gradual openness to creative destruction to allow to the acquisition of new economic <coughs> capabilities? And what, so the whole bit I've shown you is providing the left hand side that we're trying to explain. And now we're moving to what are our underlying theories and how would we sort of test out these hypotheses of how the political settlement and feedback loops from the economics into the political settlement pollute, produce either sustained growths that move towards rule of law and, and a kind of rule environment or can produce negative feedback loops into further collapse. Thank you very much.